Thank you so much for everyone being here today. My name is Megumi Taguchi. I'm a coordinator of Japanese cultural program at Northampton Community College. Japanese cultural program was established in July in 2022, uh, sponsored by Japan Foundation of New York. So if you haven't had a chance to visit our website or Instagram, please do and check our future event. Most of the events are free and open for public. So if you have any question regarding to the program, please contact us through the website or Instagram. Today, we have uh, two amazing yokai experts from Japan, Matt Alter and Matthew Meyers. We are very excited to hear what yokai are and also how they play an important role in modern Japan. This is a great chance um, to learn and discuss um, about the significance of Japanese anime, video games, manga, pop cultures, literatures, um, and more about Japanese culture. So please um, bring your questions and ask during the Q&A. Also, um, please uh, let us know where you are joining this event from in the chat. Um, today I'm wearing dark costume. Um, I, I don't know if you can see, but <laughs> I'm Dougie today. Uh, I hope you are wearing something. Um, but yes, and now I will hand it over to our first speaker, Matthew Mayers. Um, Matthew, uh, you can start whenever you are ready. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, Megumi, and, and thank you to everyone at the Northampton Community College for inviting us here today to talk. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen and get started. All right. So just to give you uh, a brief introduction about who I am, my name is Matthew Meyer. I'm a yokai folklorist and artist who's living in Japan. I've been living here since 2007. Um, my background is in illustration. I studied illustration at a fine arts college in the United States. And while I was a student there, I visited Japan on a homestay program during one summer vacation. And I was very strongly influenced by not just the, the culture and the society living here, which I, I found very enjoyable, but especially with Japanese art. Uh, and, and looking at this from the eyes of an art student, uh, I was fascinated with woodblock prints and the design aspects that are uh, so definitive and unique in, in Japanese design and art. So I decided that after I graduated, I wanted to return to Japan and, and continue to pursue uh, my interest in art over here. So just to make a long story short, I graduated and I did come over to Japan. And that's when I got really interested in yokai. Uh, it, it was sort of the intersection of a number of passions for me. There was my interest in Japanese language and culture, uh, as well as art, in addition to my lifelong interest in folklore, ghosts, monsters, things like that. So it, it was a, a very strong combination of many of my interests that attracted me to the subject. And that's what I am here to tell you about today. So first, I'm just going to give you a very brief crash course on what yokai are, because some of you may be unfamiliar with the term. So yokai is a Japanese word, which sort of translates into English as monster, but it's more than that. Uh, it's made up of two kanji. The first one is yo, which means attractive, bewitching, or calamity. And the second one is kai, which means mystery or wonder. So as you can see, Yokai has a sense of sort of seductive mystery, but there's also an air of danger to it. The definition that I use when I'm talking about yokai in English is supernatural creatures and phenomena from Japanese folklore. And what I mean by that specifically, uh, it's creatures and phenomena, meaning that it covers the entire realm of the supernatural. So it's not enough to say they're monsters. It's not enough to say they're spirits or demons or gods or this or that. It can also be 
mysterious lights, mysterious fires, sounds, feelings, even magic or curses. All of these fit under the umbrella term of yokai. I say that it's Japanese and that it's specific to Japan. Um, you know, we already have words for these things in English. We can say monster, we can say magic, we can say spirit. So if we're talking about English or European or, or monsters that exist already in our culture, it doesn't make sense to use the word yokai. So I only use the word yokai to refer to Japanese things. And finally, it's folklore. And what I mean by that specifically is that it's not owned by anybody. It's, it's owned by the folk. It's owned by everybody in a way. Uh, there's no copyright on folklore, meaning that creatures like uh, Godzilla cannot be yokai. Um, creatures like you know, Pikachu or, or other copyright creatures cannot be yokai. And also it's different from mythology, which has its own sort of canon book usually that ser serves as a source material. With folklore, uh, it's constantly changing from place to place and person to person. So there's no solid definition. So the, to go more into that, the essence of yokai is that they're unknown and unknowable. Um, with all yokai, there are exceptions to every rule. There's no scientific or Linnaean classification system where we can say all yokai like this act a certain way and all yokai like this act a certain way. Every, every yokai has exceptions to the rule. There's also contradictions everywhere. Uh, when you go to one area in Japan, you'll hear, hear stories about a yokai. You go to another area of Japan, you'll hear stories about the same yokai, but they're different. And because it's folklore, we have no ability to say this one is right and this one is wrong. They're both right, even if they contradict each other. So you have to sort of embrace and enjoy those expectations when you're enjoying yokai stories. And finally, this one's a little hard to grasp, but they defy explanation. As I just said in the definition of the word, it means mystery and wonder. That unknown aspect is a key part of what yokai are. We can't ever truly know what they are. So the more we explain them, the more they lose that yokai quality that makes them unknowable. So it's, it's important to embrace the fact that at some point we just don't know what they are and why they do what they do. Okay, so that was a little bit abstract. Let's get a little bit more solid. I'm gonna give you a very simplified lightning crash course history of yokai based on the history of Japan. So this is really simple. Please don't get mad at me if you're studying Japanese history. This is ultra simplified. But if we break Japanese history down into five periods, ancient, the Heian period or the classical period, then the Middle Ages, the Edo period with the Shogun, the Tokugawa Shogun, and then the post-war period. If we look at the development of yokai over each of these periods of times, they can sort of illuminate bits of Japanese history. So for example, during ancient times, uh, the yokai that we see are often demonifications of local tribal leaders who resisted subjugation by the, by the central government in Japan. So they would send warriors out to conquer their neighboring tribes. And then when the stories were written about them, the tribes were turned into demons or monsters or dragons or giant spiders or some other creatures. And they became these mythical stories about heroes slaying monsters. But it's actually, a, there's a kernel of historical truth buried in that. During the Heian period, uh, it was sort of a, a golden age of the imperial nobility and court life. So there was a, a very strong imperial cult centered around Kyoto, the capital. And there was a lot of political intrigue and backstabbing, like sort of like Game of Thrones. Uh, you had nobles vying against each other for various positions and fighting each other. And a lot of the yokai that come from that period are echoes of that culture. They're, they're ghosts of nobles who were wronged and then came back after they died as, as cursed ghosts and things like that to go after their political enemies. So a lot of supernatural culture was built up around pacifying ghosts and keeping them from cursing you in your next life. So we see a lot of classical ghost stories coming from this time period. 
During the Middle Ages, uh, this was a period of a lot of internal strife in Japan. There was a lot of uh, civil conflict, a lot of wars going on. So what we see are a lot of yokai that are centered around that samurai culture, the warrior culture. We see monsters uh, that have to be slain by samurai. We see demons that uh, foretell the future and, and, uh, and bring up all kinds of uh, interesting uh, sorcery and magical context in their stories. Then during the Edo period, there was a long, long period of stability in Japan, uh, a very rich literary culture built up. So people began to become interested in yokai on a whole different scale. They were mass produced in, in printed books and sold all over the country and especially in Edo or Tokyo today. And so these stories reflect the, the thoughts and the fears and the hopes and the joys of the people of those times. Then in, in the 20th century, in the post-war period, there was sort of a, a die out of yokai culture because they were seen as backwards and anti-scientific for a long time. But um, post-World War II, a comic artist named Mizuki Shigeru repopularized yokai. He, he was researching them and began making comics about them. And there's a very famous comic called Gegege no Kitaro and an animation version of that. Uh, which repopularized Japan for generations and, and is still very popular today. Uh, if you speak to any Japanese person, they'll tell you they, they know Gegege no Kitaro. And a lot of the uh, reason yokai are preserved today and well-loved today is thanks to Mizuki Shigeru and Gegege no Kitaro. Uh, so quick crash course is over. Uh, now we're going to talk about types of yokai. And this is also going to be very, very quick and light, but um, when I talk about yokai, I like to split them into four different categories. It's not a canonical category system. Different people have different ways of dividing them, but this is the way I do it. Oni or demons, onryo or ghosts, kaibutsu or monsters, and kai, which are phenomenon. So let's just go through each of these and take a look at some examples of them. So here's Otakemaro, a, a large demon who terrorized Japan during the Middle Ages. He's an example of a person, a human being whose evil deeds and sin transformed him into a monster. Dodomeki is another example of a woman who stole things and became this uh, demon with many, many eyes. There are examples of humans who changed into demons by strong emotions like love or hate. So not just sin, but just attachment or, or strong feelings can transform you into an oni. Another example. There are also just flat out evil spirits. Um, long, long ago, before yokai were developed so much, basically the word for evil spirit was oni. And so a lot of these uh, ghosts and demons and, and creatures from ancient times are also known as oni. And they can just be evil spirits that wander the earth and, and do terrible things to people. Next, you will find the servants of hell or creatures that live in the underworld and serve masters down there. So here are just some of the many examples of oni. Next, onryo or ghosts. This is a very broad category, but We'll look at a few different types of onryo. There are the souls of people who died while feeling strong emotions. And these are some famous examples from story, Kohara Koheji and Otsuyu. Onryo can also be the wandering spirits of living people. So these are not simply dead ghosts like we think of with the word ghost in English. They can be the living energy of living people detach from their body, go off and do something ghostly, scare someone, kill someone, and then return back to you, to your living body. There are tatarigami, which means curse god. These are, like I mentioned before, the spirits of ancient nobility that were wronged during life. So in death, they come back as powerful evil forces. Uh, they're often the personifications of natural disasters, like hurricanes, typhoons, earthquakes, 
uh, volcanoes, even plagues, can all be blamed on these tatarigami. And onyo are not just restricted to humans. This onyo, for example, is the spirit of uh, snapping turtles, which have been eaten in soup, and they come back to take vengeance upon people who ate turtle soup. Or the ghost of a whale that was hunted in the sea and who takes to the ocean and now curses villages where there are lots of whalers. Okay, next is kaibutsu, which is the largest, uh, largest category. And I'm just gonna breeze through these because we're running short on time, but we've got shape-changing animals, divine messengers, transformed humans, objects which have come to life, spirits of possession, creatures that control you and make you feel an emotion, fantastic beasts like chimeras and other monsters like that, and many, many other different creatures in this broad category. And the last category is kai, which means phenomena. And that includes phantom sounds, eerie lights, mysterious fires, curses and magic spells, unexplainable illness. Okay, so I breezed through all of that because I wanted to get to these stories before uh, time runs out. I have two yokai stories uh, prepared for you tonight. They're very, very short. Uh, they both come from the same book, which is Shokoku Hyaku Monogatari, which means 100 tales from various provinces. It was written in the 17th century and it collects stories from all across Japan. Uh, it, this will give you an idea of what yokai stories sound like. They're a little bit short. They're often weird and abruptly end. So uh, if it's not used to the type of ghost story that you're normally used to listening to, um, that's part of the point. So I hope you enjoy these. Our first story is Sugiyama Hyobu of Dewa Province's Double Wife Disaster. There was a samurai from Dewa province named Sugiyama Hyobu. One night, his wife went out the back door to use the outhouse. She returned a little while later and went to bed. A short while later, there was a knock on the door. Who's there? asked Hyobu. His wife's voice answered. Hyobu was perplexed. He opened the door to let her in. Then he lit a lantern and inspected the two women closely. They were identical to each other in every way. He was even more perplexed. When morning came, Hyobu put both of his wives to work in different areas of the house. No matter how he tested them, there was no difference between them at all. He continued to scrutinize them to no avail when finally a neighbor told him, a yokai will always have round hands like paws. So Hyobu looked closely at both of the wives' hands. As it turned out, one of the wives' hands were slightly rounder than the others. Surely she was the yokai. So Hyobu immediately cut her head off. Unfortunately, that one turned out to be the real wife. So that meant the other wife must be the yokai. So Hyobu went to go cut her head off. She tried everything to stop him. She begged, she lamented, she cursed him, but he would not listen to her. Finally, he cut her head off. But then upon closer inspection, she turned out to be the actual wife. Hyobu was completely perplexed. He left the wives' corpses out for a few days to see if they would transform back, but neither one changed at all. Such strange things do happen, don't they? All right, so that's an example of a yokai story that's a little bit silly. The next one is a little bit creepier. This one is from the same book. It's called The Samurai Shiryo from Sendai. A samurai from Sendai in Oshu disobeyed his master's orders and committed suicide at a temple called Toganji. During his funeral, his body was placed in a coffin and attended by 10 monks. As the night grew late, all of the monks went to sleep around the coffin. While the two lowest ranking monks had not yet fallen asleep, the corpse crawled out of the coffin and went over to a lamp. It tore the paper covering off the lamp and twisted it into a paper wick. Then using the wick, it dipped it into the lamp oil and licked it up. 
Then it crawled over to the highest ranking monk, dipped the paper wick into his nose, and then licked it. One by one, the corpse did this to each of the monks in descending rank, until finally it came next to the two lowest ranking monks. They were so scared that they ran away into the kitchen and told everybody what had happened. Everyone in the temple was suspicious, so they went to investigate. They found all of the monks lying just as they were, dead. The coffin was still there, but the corpse was gone. What a strange and unique occurrence. The end. So those are just two examples of stories. Um, this is what I do for a living now. I, I translate stories and illustrate them. You can find more examples in my four books. Uh, you can also find them on yokai.com and you can support me on Patreon uh, just to continue to get sort of information like this. Um, anyway, that's my time. So I'd like to turn it over back to Megumi and Matt Alt. So thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Matthew. And our next speaker is Matt Alter. Um, you can start whenever you are ready. Great. Well, I'm going to share my screen. Can everybody hear me? Am I uh, am I audible? Excellent. Well, let me share my screen here. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Megumi. I am Matt Alt. I am the co-author of numerous uh, books about yokai uh, associated phenomena, such as Yurei, which are Japanese ghosts, and uh, also a uh, translator, uh, Hiroko, uh, and I translated this book, Japan Demonium Illustrated, which I'll be getting into in, in a few minutes here. We are, uh, Hiroko and I, for the last 20 years or so, have been running a what's known as a localization company in Tokyo. Localization is a fancy word for translation, and we specialize in translating, uh, producing the English versions of Japanese video games, of things like manga, uh, toys, their toy packaging, toy catalogs and instructions, books and uh, films, uh, even sometimes going from English into Japanese, uh, although we mainly specialize in doing Japanese into English. So over those many years of working in this field, it's kind of put us in the beating heart of the Japanese content production industry. And that led us to ask ourselves a question, which is, why is Japan so great at creating uh, compelling pop cultural characters? And when I started asking this, you know, Hiroko, my wife, who is Japanese and uh, who is who is born and raised here, immediately brought up the idea that yokai were uh, sort of the forerunners of many of the pop cultural characters that we see today. And the more we started to investigate that thread, the more we realized just how true that really was. Now, when we talk about yokai culture, you know, and we talk about character culture, you, there are so many examples of Japanese pop cultural franchises that are populated by monstrous creatures of one kind or another. Everybody, of course, knows the Pokemon. And uh, these characters are often portrayed in big kind of parades or hordes where you have to have guidebooks to find them all. There's the many monsters of the Monster Hunter series. There's the many strange anthropomorphic creatures of the Power Rangers series. Monster-fueled entertainment has been a staple of Japanese pop culture in the post-war era, but the roots go back far, far earlier than that as well. Uh, oh, and also, how could I forget? Mascot culture, Japan's anthropomorphic mascot culture. If you spend any time on the street in Japan, you will see little uh, objects with faces and personalities exhorting you to do all sorts of things like recycle or to stay safe from the waves. Uh, even things like tsunami prevention drills use anthropomorphizations of, uh, of natural phenomena, in this case, in the form of waves to advertise safety drills and things like that. So you see this kind of anthropomorphic uh, character culture everywhere in Japan. And the big question is, where, where does it come from? Where does it come from? Hiroko and I believe that there is a kind of three-legged, uh, if you'd like to call it, a, a, a triple kind of influence on what creates what the wellspring of this of this yokai culture is and the first aspect of that is that japan is a deeply polytheistic culture its spiritual traditions are polytheistic 
Polytheism is the idea that there is not just one God, as there is in the Western monotheistic tradition, but many gods. Uh, in fact, according to Shinto lore, uh, the islands of Japan are populated by some 8 million kami, which is the local word for deities. And that isn't intended as a literal accounting, but more of a, uh, a way to account for an unaccountable multitude. Um, and those kami take the form of everything from creators on high all the way down to more quotidian everyday presences. There was even a pop song a few years ago about a toire no kamisama, a god of the toilet. So uh, gods in Japan don't necessarily have to be these almighty sorts of, of, of existences as we think of gods in the West. And they can be, they, they're believed to inhabit all sorts of places. Some live on high, others inhabit terrain, some inhabit natural things like trees or waterfalls. Uh, there are even kami believed to inhabit things like words. So this idea that not just living things, but anything can harbor a spirit is known as animism. And animism is another sort of defining force in Japanese spirituality. Now, these concepts are still very much active in modern Japanese society today. Shinto, of course, is Japan's native religion. And if you come to Japan, you will see Shinto shrines venerating various or multiple kami uh, all over Japan. In fact, there are more Shinto shrines than there are convenience stores in Japan, which is kind of amusing when you think about the fact that many surveys of Japanese people will come back with them saying, no, we're not religious at all. But in fact, these kind of religious sites are found all over Japan. And with regards to animism, I invite you to look at this picture on the lower left. Hiroko and I took it in Ueno Park. It is a monument to eyeglasses, uh, thanking them for helping us see. Now, no modern Japanese person believes that their eyeglasses are haunted or, or, or filled with kami or spirit or anything like that. But this is just a modern vestige of the idea that we should show gratitude to the things in the world around us that support us. You know, Japan was an agrarian culture uh, where you couldn't really make it on your own. You had to be in a village to pull together enough people to till the fields. You were dependent on the sun. You were dependent on the rain. That dependency on the natural world created this kind of sense of gratitude and undoubtedly fueled this kind of polytheistic, animistic worldview that still infuses Japanese culture today in the way that even if you're not a, a Christian in, in the West, that Judeo-Christian sort of backdrop fuels a lot of what we how we see the world so polytheism animism this is one leg of the yokai tripod so to speak a second is that japan had a very very long storytelling tradition that goes back over a thousand years this is genji monogatari uh, it is the world's first modern novel and so you have this very developed storytelling tradition for a very long time and this storytelling tradition in turn was fueled by the fact that Japan has a lot of regional folklore and oral storytelling traditions. Matthew uh, touched on those in, in his speech uh, in that these oral sorts of fables and legends were passed from person to person. So storytelling was very much a part of Japanese culture since time immemorial. And then around a thousand years ago, uh, the first modern sorts of novels started to come out of Japan, modern storytelling traditions. Japan also has a long history of craftsmanship. In uh, pre-modern Japan, craftspeople actually occupied a rung of society of their own. Uh, it was, to, you know, Japan was then a kind of caste society with samurai at the top, farmers, craftspeople, and then business people at the bottom. Uh, craftspeople were venerated basically for their incredible ability to make things. And uh, uh, you can see examples of this craftsmanship all over Japan. This craftsmanship combined with the storytelling tradition came to, whoops, this is actually jumping ahead here, came to give us in the Edo era, highly refined popular visual arts. We like to think of Japan as a, you know, a unified uh, singular society today, and it is. But it wasn't always the case. Japan in the uh, up until about 1600 was a patchwork of, of little fiefdoms, kingdoms and warlords vying for power. 
That all changed in 1600 when the country was unified under the shogun Tokugawa Ieyasu. The unification of Japan brought peace, relative peace to the land, and along with it, the rise of a middle class. And particularly in urban areas where you had a wealthy, educated, and bored middle class, you got a demand for all sorts of entertainment. And Japanese craftspeople and storytellers came together in the form of illustrated works that were sold in the form of books or just standalone illustrations to entertain people. On the left, this is a beautiful print here on the left. Um, it is a it portrays a character known as Tenjiku Tokube, who was a famous adventurer in real life Japan, but 100 years after his death was kind of canonized as the superhero who in his travels to India had learned secret magic that allowed him to conjure phantom toads to defeat his enemies. Uh, this character became the basis for another character, a ninja known as Jiraiya in the early 1800s, who later became the inspiration for an anime many of you have probably heard of called Naruto. And although this conversation isn't about ninja, since I just brought them up, I have to just show you guys this on the right. On the right is the first ever illustration of a ninja as we know them today, a uh, kind of sneaky person dressed in black garb. This illustration was by uh, Katsushika Hokusai, he of the great wave over Kanagawa, one of Japan's greatest artists. And he drew this kind of as a joke in one of his uh, art collections called, tellingly, Hokusai Manga. This illustration from the 1850s is where all of that ninja culture that we know today comes from. It comes out of this ukiyo-e woodblock tradition that was the staple of how illustrations were printed in the Edo era of the 17th to the 19th centuries. And actually today, I, I think you can make the argument that ninja and yokai are sort of the proto-mass media characters that we consume today. They're still popular today. So Edo era, you have this highly refined visual art culture. And you have this tradition of storytelling, this tradition of oral tales. Well, in Edo of that time period, yokai related entertainment was some of the most popular in, in Japanese cities. You had yokai books, entire books devoted to yokai tales. You had yokai fashions. This is a, uh, a, a fireman's, uh, uh, like a, a thick coat that a fireman would wear here with a beautiful illustration of a yokai, a spider on it. You had yokai games. Uh, there were parlor games, such as Hyaku Monogatari, which is a, uh, a sort of group game where everybody would get together in a dark house at night and tell 99 scary stories uh, with the hope that when the 99th was told and the last candle of the night was blown out, that a yokai would appear and scare the daylights out of everybody who had gathered there to, to hear those spooky stories in the summer months. There were even yokai karuta cards. These karuta are uh, used to play a traditional Japanese game. And you can see on them, they have yokai motifs. And it's really just fascinating and interesting to me to think that hundreds of years before Pokemon swept the world, that people in Edo were playing with yokai cards that are really startlingly evocative of the ones that modern kids and adults uh, play with today. So now you have this kind of understanding of how yokai culture thanks both to what matthew was saying and, and what i was talking about here about how yokai kind of arose from the japanese oral tradition and were sculpted into uh the roots of what we'd consider modern characters today but i'd like to talk a little bit more about that yokai culture in depth so yokai is a relatively modern word it actually only became widely used in the 20th century. Before then, yokai were known by a variety of other names. Uh, obake, bakemono, mononoke, all of these things, oni, uh, depending on what era we're talking about. All of these words share a certain root, uh, bakeru in Japanese. Bakeru is a word that means changed or transformed. So a bakemono is literally a transformed thing, but we could think of it in colloquial English as shapeshifters. People of old saw yokai as shapeshifters. They were things that would change form to either trick us or hurt us or simply spook us. And that's one of the big reasons that there are so many different types of yokai out there. Uh, Matthew has organized his in a slightly different way than we do. Uh, we're mainly focused on the kind of visual aspects of how they appear, uh, because in our books, we, you know, 
we kind of organize them into a guidebook style. They're human shaped yokai. There are yokai that we would as associate with something monstrous, you know, like giant skeletons or kind of frogmen. There are yokai animals, animals that that change shape and, and take different forms to trick us. There are even yokai of man-made objects that for whatever reason have taken uncanny sentient form to trouble us in some way or another. Now, I am just, this is an echo of what Matthew was saying. We too, Hiroko and I too, believe that yokai should only be translated as yokai. This is an old actual trick of the localization trade, which is that when you have a word that is succinct and that captures a unique cultural phenomenon, you actually shouldn't translate it at all. You should use that word as is in the English translation as an anchor to the person who is going through and, and, and actually interacting with it. So there's actual many examples of this in modern life. We don't call this food raw fish on rice. It sounds kind of gross. We call it sushi. Nor do we call this type of historical personage, personage a old Japanese soldier. We call them a samurai. That's because they have so much cultural background and baggage that actually deconstructing them uh, means you lose meaning. So that's why we use the Japanese words for these things. And like Matthew, uh, we also agree that yokai are yokai. The words monster or demon uh, just have too much Western cultural baggage to define what yokai are. So yokai tales, as Matthew was saying, started a very long time ago in the oral tradition. But in modern, semi-modern times, the first ones that were actually put down to paper can be dated back to about a thousand years ago. This is the Konjaku Monogatari Shu. And this collection of stories contains one that talks about a monstrous parade that would manifest on the streets of Kyoto at certain inauspicious times of the month or year, and anybody who caught sight of it, of these strange creatures parading through the streets, would be struck blind or sick or generally, or in, a, in, a, in the worst case, die. So people would actually avoid going out at times when this sort of thing was happening. So there are actual historical records of yokai-like phenomena in the Japanese literature record. Those yokai parades which are known in Japanese as Hyakiyagyo, uh, the demon's night parade. Actually, it's where Matthew's books take their name from, is became the source of inspiration for a lot of Japanese artists over the centuries, starting particularly in the 15th century, but only accelerating uh, later on uh, in the Edo period when, when things got a little bit more peaceful. Those yokai parades form the basis for a lot of Japanese art. And if you look in the Japanese art record, you'll find things like this beautiful screen by Kawanabe Kyosai showing a uh, demonic yokai parade. Um, and Hiroko and I prefer the term Japandemonium to define these parades because yokai aren't really demons, as we said. They don't necessarily come out at night. And the parades, sometimes they parade, sometimes they don't. It's actually much more like a pandemonium, a kind of riot, a supernatural riot in the streets. So Hiroko and I coined the term Japandemonium to uh, describe what happens when yokai swarm in parades like this. In 1776, an author by the name of Toriyama Sekien took the idea of these yokai parades and these yokai hordes to create a book series of his own uh, that he called Gazu Hyakiyagyo, the illustrated Hyakiyagyo, and which we translated as Japandemonium Illustrated. Uh, Hiroko and I tracked down copies of these books. They still exist. They were mass produced. Uh, we found beautiful editions in the Smithsonian Institution, uh, Freer and Sackler Galleries archives, and we used them to prepare a translation uh, that was published a few years back. But Toriyama Sekien's work is really key from a variety of perspectives. Number one, his work was art, of course. He's a beautiful artist, but it was mass produced. Uh, unlike scrolls or paintings, which were intended for the elite or for special places, uh, you had to go see them. Mass produced art in the form of books was something anybody could own. And after they were published in 1776, Sekien's books became bestsellers in Japan to the point where he published three sequels of them. 
Sekien was took a really interesting approach to what he did. Unlike the screens and old uh, uh, paintings of yokai that didn't have backgrounds, he gave each one of his yokai a, a sort of uh, a physical setting. He kind of grounded them in, in a reality. And this is the first book in his Japan Demonium Illustrated Trilogy. And this is the table of contents. And this is another innovation. He organized them. He organized yokai into this sort of guidebook form. Now, Sekien was not a demonologist. He was not somebody who was necessarily a folklorist. He was an artist and he had a wicked sense of humor. And at the time in Edo, in the 1770s, the most popular forms of book were encyclopedias and almanacs, books that purported to contain information that you could use that had utility uh, in your life. And as a satire of this, Sekien created an encyclopedia with no actual real world use at all because it organized information about yokai. And he pulled the yokai in his books from all over the place. He, local legends, folklore, uh, the literature of both Japan, China, and elsewhere. And he made this monster compendium. Many of the yokai that he drew represented the first time any of these oral traditions had ever been committed to, to paper. He was the first person to kind of make visuals for them. And the ironic aspect of this is that by becoming bestsellers, Sekien's books actually became the de facto reference guide and standard for drawing many of these creatures. In fact, the way that we visualize a lot of the yokai can be traced directly back to the illustrations that Sekien did in the pages of his book. And uh, these are just two here. I'm sorry, this isn't as high resolution as I was hoping. But you can also see he has little descriptions along the side of them that tell you what piece of literature or what piece of folklore these creatures came from. And he had, over the course of four uh, uh, books, portrayed hundreds of yokai this way and made him a sort of uh, yokai master of, of the Edo period. As Matthew was saying, uh, after the Edo period came the Meiji period and Japan started to modernize. And as Japan rushed to modernize, a lot of these yokai traditions were sort of swept under the rug. Uh, the authorities didn't want people believing in what they called superstitions, uh, old wives' tales. These things were seen as an impediment to progress. And so for many, many years, uh, I wouldn't say yokai were taboo, but they certainly weren't anything that was influencing modern Japanese popular culture of that era. That all changed at the turn of the 20th century when an expat by the name of Lafcadio Hearn, uh, a Greek-born, Irish-educated uh, American, uh, started his career in America as a journalist, uh, arrived in Japan and began chronicling Japanese society for uh, uh, Harper's Magazine, uh, sending dispatches back to the United States. And he was fascinated by the supernatural. And... Lafcadio, together with his wife, uh, a Japanese woman named Setsuko Koizumi, who was a kind of walking encyclopedia of Japanese yokai lore, compiled uh, written records of many of these oral traditions and published them in English before they were even published in Japanese. Uh, those books caused a sensation in the West. And when they were translated back into Japanese, Japanese people were like, wow, this is great stuff. The, all of these stories that we had known but never actually seen written down. And they triggered a mini boom for uh, Japanese folklore in Japan at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, by the way, this is on the bottom right here. This is Kwaidan. This is a movie that I highly recommend you try to stream. It is based on Lafcadio's uh, her and stories heard from Setsuko based in Japan and is one of the most atmospheric and amazing Japanese horror movies ever made. There's a sort of baton touch here as Lafcadio Hearn's stories rekindle interest in Japanese folklore. A folklorist by the name of Yanagita Kunio around 1910 published a book called The Legends of Tono. This is available in English now. It is filled with regional folklore from a city called Tono and sparked a real reappraisal of Japanese pop culture, uh, of Japanese uh, uh, folklore as a form of uh, uh, kind of uh, unique aspect of the Japanese uh, character. 
Unfortunately, all of this came to a crushing, grinding halt with World War II and all of the horrors that in that uh, ensued. But immediately after World War II, uh, an artist by the name of Mizuki Shigeru mined those same folklore, those same myths, those same oral traditions that people like Yanagita Kunio, Lafcadio Hearn, and most importantly, Sekien, had first put down to paper and used it to create his own manga and anime series known as Gegege no Kitaro. Uh, many of, this was a huge hit in Japan in the 1960s. The anime, the, 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 the manga came out in 1960. It was animated in 1968 as a black and white series and many times again over the years. It's safe to say that most Japanese people, this is their first introduction to yokai lore. Uh, and for many Japanese people, uh, Mizuki's characters are, are you know, synonyms for yokai. Y Mizuki was a folklorist himself. He was very aware of these traditions. And many of his illustrations are taken directly from Sekien's work and kind of re-injected them into the Japanese mainstream, into the kind of hearts and minds of Japanese children. Now, yokai entertainment, kind of building on what Sekien uh, excuse me, what, what Mizuki did is there's a lot of yokai entertainment out there in, in modern Japanese pop culture. In the aughts, there was a fad for a, a, a cartoon series called Yokai Watch, some of you may know, that was a sort of Pokemon-influenced show. But you can see aspects of yokai lore in all sorts of Japanese entertainment. At bottom is Demon Slayer, uh, Kimetsu no Yaiba. This was the highest grossing movie on the planet, not just in Japan, on the planet in 2020. Uh, and it features not directly, but a lot of yokai influenced and oni influenced uh, uh, characters and lore in it, introducing again Japanese kind of spirituality and folklore to a new uh, uh, audience of viewers. And here's on uh, upper right is a show Netflix just greenlit uh, about oni, the Thunder God's Tale. So Japanese folklore is definitely not forgotten in Japan. It is definitely a, a kind of vibrant. Um, contributing to Japan's rise in the post-war era as a fantasy uh, superpower. In closing, you know, Matt, Matthew told you uh, uh, some fun yokai stories uh, from times of old, and I want to tell you one that kind of bridges to right now. In 1840, the residents of a uh, village in Kyushu reported seeing strange lights off the coast hovering over the ocean and eventually a lawman was dispatched to go down to the ocean and, and see what was going on and what happened shocked him he encountered a yokai hovering over the waves and it turned to look at him and it uttered its name it said i am amabie and then amabie said to the lawman if plague should come to the land show my image to the people. And then it sunk beneath the waves, uh, never to be seen again. The lawman wrote of, you know, he told the authorities of what had happened and it was written up in a local newspaper at the time. This is a, a actual copy of that article containing this really charming sketch of a mob VA. Uh, I'm not sure if it was made by the lawman himself or the reporter who he told it to, but uh, this story was printed in a Japanese newspaper and then basically uh, forgotten for centuries after a century and a half after 1840 until, until 2020 when plague really did hit the land. And some uh, yokai fan on Twitter decided to post his own drawing of a mabie, which sparked another person to share their picture of a mabie and another and another and another. Some were cute, others were stylish, some were really grotesque, a few even kind of sexy. And to a one, all of these people sharing yokai's, uh, sharing Amabie's image, were doing it to try to keep the plague at bay the only way they could at that time. Now, nobody in Japan believed that actually sharing images of Amabie would really cure us of, of you know, the coronavirus. But it's a great example of how yokai can act as mediators in situations of conflict. They can kind of deflate tension by helping us laugh or smile at situations that are unexplainable or uncontrollable. 
by drawing a mabie, we didn't do anything to actually stop the coronavirus, but we did connect with one another. And that's what yokai really are. There are ways that we connect with one another by telling stories and by putting faces on phenomena that scare us all. Amavie was so successful at kind of deflating the tension to a degree that the Japanese government even adopted Amavie, the original illustration of Amavie, to use as the mascot in its COVID-19 prevention campaigns. All of this goes to show you, yokai never die. They just bide their time waiting for the right moment to reappear. Amabie is a great example of that. If you go to Japan, I guarantee you will see her everywhere. Anyway, that's it. I think I've hit my uh, uh, limit for my presentation. Have I? Is there more? I can tell. I can, I can keep talking about this all day, uh, but I think that's about it for me. So maybe we can throw the floor open yeah. to Q and A. Yes. Q and A. Okay. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you. Uh, so so now we are going to move on to Q and A. Um, so you should be able to unmute yourself. Um, so, okay, so you are able to unmute yourself right now. So please either leave your question in the chat or raise your hand. Go ahead, Rani. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, Hi. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, I have a question for you guys. Um, I'm a Japanophile, I guess, like a lot of people are. And I started watching a show called Old Enough, where you have two oh, and yeah. three year olds. I love that show. <laughs> two and three year olds uh, who are, oh my goodness. Anyway, they're sent out to run an errand. And my husband and I were watching this. We don't know much about Japanese culture and noticed what looks like their parents giving them some kind of an amulet mm -hmm. on their way out. Now, is that, how do I say that? Is that, is that an integral part of Japanese culture to, you know, have, you know, in the same way, I guess, in Judeo-Christian heritage, you know, you wear a cross or, you know, every culture has its own superstitious beliefs. Is that part of the history or culture of, you know, protecting your children by giving them an amulet? Is that a, a very kind of broad connection to the yokai? I don't know if my question makes any sense to you, but um, uh, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm sure Matthew. I'm sure Matthew has his own take on this. They're not they're not directly connected to the yokai, sure. but they're not unconnected either. Those amulets are actually sold at uh, usually at Buddhist temples, but also at, at Shinto shrines as well. Uh, and okay. they're actually um, and there's all sorts of amulets of protect. They're called omamori, and there's Omamori for uh, traffic safety, you know, to, to kind of in hopes that you don't get into a traffic accident of some kind. There are Omamori for studying. There are Omamori for, uh, you know, safe childbirth or a kind of recovery from illness. So they are integral aspects of Japanese spirituality. They're also kind of the prototypes of souvenirs. Uh, in Japan, spirituality and prayer and play have been kind of really integrally connected uh for a very long time and japanese people the, the roots of japanese tourism is that our people would would go to shrines and temples as a as an outing and when they were there uh you know all sorts of vendors would set up and sell them things the temples and shrines themselves would vend uh amulets and so even today in modern times you know the idea that when you go to a shrine you pick up an amulet to you know as a as a kind of form of protection is uh, still very much uh, alive in Japan. I don't know that anybody really believes that by holding out this amulet, you're going to, cars are going to bounce off you. <laughs> you know, right. like everybody knows, you know, this but, is the real world with, you know, real physics and all meant, of that kind of are thing. Are you meant to, to, to evoke, invoke, or summon a spiritual energy at the very least? Is that the S point of the amulet? So it, it's just a kind of it, it's it's a kind of spiritual protection, and they can be associated with the kami that is at that shrine or the Buddhist deity that is being venerated at the temple. I don't know that it, that anybody believes that 
the kami or whatever resides in there. It's just a kind of uh, uh, amulet that shows you are thinking of one another, so to speak. Right. And, you know, kind of like a fetish. Yeah, a little bit like that. Or in the sense of like, once you've done everything you can do, you have to kind of throw things to the kami, so to speak. You know what I mean? You have to you have to leave it up to them. And that amulet is a sort of recognition that there are things out of our hands that we just kind of hope that there are people watching over us, people Thank in the form of deities or protectors. Thank you very much. Thanks. Hi. Uh, do you mind if I ask a question? Please. So I recently visited Korea. I don't know how related this is, but I visited and I noticed a bunch of similar things. Like they had a bunch of little trinkets that uh, I was told, you know, after it was translated that some of them meant uh, this is so you can study better or this one is for good fortune. This one's for good luck. Is that, is that related by any chance? It was probably a Buddhist temple, right? It would actually was a Buddhist temple. Yes, it was. Yeah. So yeah, Buddhism came to Japan via Korea. Um, oh, interesting. Okay. In around the year seven, in the seven hundreds, uh, it was. It came to Japan and it came to Korea through China, and it came to China from India. So there is that similar. I haven't actually been to Korea, uh, but I can imagine that there's a very similar amulet vending sort of thing going on. Obviously, there's different Buddhist sects and different ways of practicing Buddhism in schools and things, but the right. the fundamentals. Uh, it sounds very similar. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. I didn't know that. Bring it on. Nobody has any hauntings. Nobody has any strange creatures lurking in their in their houses. You know, Matthew or I could probably tell you what those strange creaking sounds are you hear at night. Uh, you know. Can I say something? Please. Yeah, uh, my name is Ruth and I didn't know anything about this. And thank you for making this presentation because it's fascinating. And thank you for opening that door for me to a new you know, rem, uh, knowledge. Excellent. Thank you so much. Excellent. I'm very happy to hear that. Yes, thank you. No question, <laughs> just that? Thank you. <laughs> uh, Rami, do you want to go next? Hi, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. It's pretty interesting to learn more about kind of the history past and present of yokai. I'm kind of interested in how yokai are coming, in a way, coming back, but maybe it's more like a new resurgence of yokai kind of separated from their historical roots, especially through, you know, the return of amabie and games and manga and anime. And especially now that a lot of these are, you know, popular around the world, would you say that yokai as well are kind of globalizing too? And almost in a way that, you know, we can't translate the word yokai, would it become part of like English language, like some other la Japanese God, words have become? So. <laughs> I mean, I think if you look at now compared to 10 years ago, um, the, the global awareness of what yokai are has increased just indescribably uh, large. I mean, 10, even 15 years ago, um, you know, if you said the word yokai, people would have no idea what you're talking about. Today, if you say it, there are still some people who don't know what it is, but I'd say the, the vast majority of people who are online, uh, aware of, you know, who have Netflix subscriptions, who, who played video games, probably are familiar with the word yokai. At the very least, they, they've heard it, they know it's something Japanese. So uh, global awareness has certainly skyrocketed just in the past uh, 10 to 15 years, I think. Definitely, I completely agree. You know, when Hiroko and I published our book, uh, Yokai Attack, the Japanese Monster Survival Guide, we published this, well, oh, it disappeared like a yokai. When we published this in 2008, the word yokai had not entered the lexicon at all, even among fan circles. And there was quite a bit of debate at Kodansha International, who published it at the time. Now it's published by a company called Tuttle. But uh, there was quite a bit of debate with the higher ups as to whether we should put yokai in the title or not. Um, and Hiroko and I were really adamant that we should do it. And I, to my knowledge, I think that's the first mainstream book in English to feature showcase yokai and certainly to use yokai in its title. And I have heard over the years, even from some of our clients, 
that it gave a lot of creators in Japan the, the, the kind of confidence to say, this, these are yokai. We're not going to call them demons. We're not going to call them monsters. And there's all sorts of Japanese video games now that feature yokai characters. You know, the Neo series. There's many like very specific yokai related games. And most recently, Hiroko and I worked on one for Platinum called World of Demons that did use demons in the title, but uses yokai in the actual uh, game itself. But it's it's certainly like Matthew. I 100% agree with Matthew. It's just it's become a kind of lingua franca, especially among anime and manga fans. And to get to your original question, I really hope it makes it into the Oxford English Dictionary as a loan word. That's literally here one of Hiroko and my main dreams. And not just in the English language too, but but globally as well. Yes. my books have been translated into other languages as well. So I just went to uh, Italy earlier this year for a book fair and. The, the number of people there who were conscious of yokai with even so few books printed in Italian uh, about yokai, but they still knew what yokai were. Uh, it, it surprised me. I was not expecting that kind of reaction, but um, that's great. Yeah, I think the word has taken root across the globe. So I, I don't think we're, we have to worry, wait too long before it's in the, the Oxford English Dictionary either, Matt. Who's got their hands up? Hello, Domain, uh, do you want to okay. go next? Thank you very much. Um, I, thank you both for, for really informative, interesting presentations. I am curious about the artwork you were showing. Uh, most of it, some of it flashed by very quickly. Sorry. Uh, and it was, <laughs> uh, but it was really interesting and uh, mostly looked very contemporary and, uh, but, but, uh, a lot of uh, yokai that I'm, I'm familiar with from older artwork too. And I'm just wondering where it's coming from because I think you didn't necessarily uh, give a source or an artist. And is this coming out of manga or is this something that's that's just illustrations online? I'm just wondering where the artwork came from and, and, and how it was created that you've been using to show us. Uh, the artwork in my presentation was all created by me, myself. Um, so those are from my yokai books and from my website yokai.com. And in our case, uh, Hiroko and I teamed up for the yokai attack series and its sequels, Yurei Attack and Ninja Attack. Hiroko and I are, are, are not, we are writers. Uh, we aren't artists like Matthew is. Uh, we aren't multi-talented like he is. We work together with, uh, we wrote the books, but we work together with our friends who are manga artists in Japan. In our circle of friends, we have quite a few manga artists. And we worked with a different manga artist for each one of our books to capture a sort of different spirit, pun intended, uh, for each one of them. So, and then of course, Japandemonium Illustrated, the other one that I mentioned, uh, Sekien's books, that's all based on Toriyama Sekien's uh, art from the 1770s. So, and that's a translation. That's not our uh, origination. So yeah, Matthew draws his own stuff. We work with uh, manga artists or translate existing art. Oh, thank you very much. And, and Matthew, I, I apologize if you that was part of the introduction. I was unable to get into this. Oh, no, no. You, you're right. We, that's all right. I actually appreciate something. the feedback that we were going too fast. I think I need to slow that. There's so much history. It's, it's tough to get a thousand years into 30 minutes. It really is. Yeah. I know the presentation wasn't too fast, but Matthew's images flashed by something. I see. Quickly. Yeah, I know. I, uh, there's there's so much to show and, and only only so much time to show it in and I, yeah. and I didn't want to step on anyone's feet for time so no, it was lovely lovely images and thank you very thanks much. for coming thank you um jennifer do you want to go next hi guys i'm a big fan i have both of your guys's books oh um, thank you thank you big big fan um i love to read yokai attacks with my kids they oh, love that's it great um, I'm actually headed to Japan to visit one of my best friends who's stationed in Atsugi next mm -hmm. April. Is there mm -hmm. anywhere that you would recommend that may be haunted or like yokai themed that I should go? Well, I guess this is one from, you want to go be in Tokyo? Uh, she's in Atsugi, which is not too far from Tokyo. We're planning on going to Nikko for a couple days. Yeah. Then we're going to go down to oh. Kyoto for a couple days. Well, Nico is dedicated to the spirit of the Shogun Tokugawa. So, uh, you know, be on your best behavior while you're out there. The uh, haunted is is a little tough because haunted is in the eye of the beholder. But if you are into the outdoors at all, 
I would really recommend, and you're probably going to be in perfect timing for the changing of the leaves, Mount Takao, which is about an hour outside of Tokyo. I don't know how far it is from Atsugi. It's actually probably closer. Um, that is considered to be a mountain of the Tengu, which are uh, a kind of mountain spirits. Here, I can actually show you by quickly sharing a screen. Um, they are they are mountain spirits that are believed to inhabit and have been believed to inhabit that area since times of old. And you can see statues of Tengu there. Uh, they're kind of these bird cre bird like creatures. Some have bird like beaks. Others have long noses. Uh, they're protector spirits, yokai of of the mountains. And these photos uh, at left were actually all three of these were taken at Mount Takao. Giant uh, uh, sandals that are left as offerings for the Tengu, giant Tengu masks. There's also many statues. And uh, this is Tengu stuffed animals you can get there. So I would really recommend going to Mount Takao for a quick dose of your yokai lore. Um, there's also a great temple devoted to Kappa in Kappabashi, the kitchenware district of Tokyo. You can see a mummified Kappa hand there if you dare. Yeah, and, and that's, you know, that's a question that gets asked a whole lot. And it's a hard one for me to answer because um, yokai are, are sort of everywhere. So there's not really like a yokai place to go. You know, there, there's there's no place it's like, oh, come here because we have yokai, it's haunted because they are so ubiquitous. You literally cannot go to a town in Japan that doesn't have something related to folklore in it. Uh, any temple, any shrine, I mean, pretty much any street has a local legend if you're able to dig it up. Um, if you want to go to some place that has a lot of yokai, I would recommend that uh, the Miyoshi Mononoke Museum, which opened up in 2019 in Hiroshima Prefecture, uh, it's it's the largest collection of yokai material in one place, um, and it's an absolutely fantastic museum that it's just absolutely fascinating. So um, it's a little bit out of the way being in the deep in the mountains of Hiroshima, but if you can get out west, um, that, that's absolutely a like a, a yokai pil pilgrimage place, I would recommend. And going into the mountains is basically a great way to see yokai. You know what I <laughs> exactly, mean? Exactly, yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting what Matthew just said because it's totally true. And I, I should have been more clear about this in, in my talk too. Yokai didn't really have visuals until fairly recently. You know, Sekien and, and the, people who, the people who drew those yokai parade scrolls in the 1500s, until then they were believed to be invisible. And this is actually true of all kami. You know, Buddhism, when you go to a Buddhist temple, you will often see amazing, beautiful carved statuary of the Buddha himself or acolytes, avatars, um, beautiful, beautiful stuff. You never see that at Shinto shrines. The host of a Shinto shrine is often just a mirror reflecting yourself. And there aren't carvings really of, of, of kami because they're believed to be invisible. And the yokai being part of that kind of pantheon, if a little bit closer to the earthly realm than the, the rarefied one of the, of the creator kami, uh, they weren't believed to be seen either. So yeah, like a lot of the haunted places, so-called haunted places in Japan are kind of the same sorts of places you'd see on shows like Ghost Adventures or stuff like that, like really kind of broken down, scary houses. People are not looking for yokai in there. They're looking for like spirits of the dead, you know, like that that kind of thing. They're looking for ghosts or, you know, nobody nobody's looking for a tanuki there or a kappa. They're, they're looking for basically human ghosts, which is why Hiroko and I kind of think of human ghosts and Yurei as a separate thing from yokai. But that's another lecture for another time. Thank you. Also, I want to read something from chat. Um, is there any uh, recommendation um, for like a yokai documentary? Documentary. Matthew, Matthew and Hiroko and I and Zach should film one. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know about I, documentaries. There are there are several episodes of various uh, NHK world yes. shows that you can find online. Um, I can't think of like a specific episode, but if you search around, I'm sure you can find some streaming services that will have NHK episodes. Um, but yeah, documentary-wise, not so much. Nothing. Yeah, I, 
I, I am a co-host of a show called Japanology Plus on NHK, and uh, we covered yokai in at least two different episodes. So if you go like onto the NHK website or onto YouTube and search for Japanology Plus and yokai, you will certainly find those episodes on there. Uh, whether <clears throat> they're pretty short, 30 minute sorts of things, and, and we go to pretty pinpoint places, but uh, you might find them interesting. And uh, so, Danielle, uh, would you like to ask the things you put in the chat? If if not, I can read it. So, when I was in Japan in Ryokan, I saw ah. creepy women watching me at night from entrance. I wonder what kind of yokai that was. That was scary. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't. Maybe Might it was have been a, a nasty right. customer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Another lodger. <laughs> so, does Thomas have a question? Yeah, Tom. Yeah, sorry, Tom, go ahead. Hi. So uh, thank you both for getting up so early in the morning <laughs> to talk with us because we're ready to go to bed here. <laughs> okay. Um, and I have a couple of questions. I, you're both, I believe you're both American? Yes. yes. Okay, so my question is, did you find out about yokai in America? And is that what led you to move to Japan? Or did you move to Japan for some other reason? And then you found out about yokai? You want to, you want to give your origin story first, Matthew? Sure. Um, I, I found out about yokai before I knew there were yokai. Um, I took folklore classes in high school and, and I've always been in love with folklore from around the world. So, you know, when I was a kid, I already knew about Yuki Ona and Kappa, but I didn't know what yokai was. You know, the, the, the term yokai is something that I learned um, after moving to Japan. Well, maybe, I don't know, maybe I heard it once or twice in America because uh, as someone mentioned in chat, the, the Great Yokai War was released uh, internationally in 2006. I feel like I may have seen it around that time. Certainly I saw that before coming to Japan, but um, I didn't really become conscious of the word yokai until I moved to Japan and began seeing them all over the place. But as far as yokai themselves, sure, um, I had read Lafka Yohern, I had read um, Theodora Ozaki, I had read, um, you know, I'd seen the movie Kwaidan. So yokai themselves were familiar to me, but just not the word until I moved here. So the, How about you, Matt? the spirit of yokai did not demand that you move to Japan. Well, if it did, it didn't say who it was that was <laughs> calling <laughs> me. <laughs> and one other question, Matthew, you, you are an illustrator and you showed us examples of your beautiful illustrations. Uh, what medium do you use? Are they done by hand or are they computer generated or both? Both. Um, so I, I've painted with all different types of media over my life, but um, the yokai illustrations I showed today start out as pencil drawings, which are then scanned in and painted digitally. Okay. Painted digitally by hand. I've got a, you know, a, a, a tablet with a stylus, so it's by hand, but not on paper. All right. Thank you very much. And, and Matt, so, your journey? Yeah, so I'm a little bit different than Matthew. I, I was obsessed with Japanese uh, anime and, and Japanese, you know, toys in particular ever since I was, I was born in 1973. I was raised in the 80s, which was during the first wave of Japan's pop culture hitting young people all over the planet, Nintendo, Walkman, you know, Discman, PlayStation, you know, all of that sort of stuff. I actually recount this in a book, a more recent book I've done called Pure Invention, uh, how Japan made the modern world but i moved to japan uh in around 2003 with my wife who is japanese native born uh, we met in the states and we founded a company together that localized japanese entertainment products and she is the one i had known about yokai from anime and manga i hadn't realized how deep the 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 well went so to speak and she is a huge fan uh of japanese spook stories she was raised on them um and she is kind of the setsuko Koizumi to my Lafcadio Hearn, although I'm nowhere near on Lafcadio's level in that kind of, she influenced me and told me a lot of these stories. 
And when I realized there was no reference on them available in English at the time, we're talking around the early 2000s, that's what led Hiroko and I to uh, uh, write and pitch and write Yokai Attack. So that is that is our story. And you know, ever since writing that, it's just become so obvious how integral to the fabric of Japanese society those kinds of beliefs and those kinds of that kind of worldview is. All right, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. I have, I have a question for Megumi. Okay. <laughs> so Megumi, you were born in Japan and mm -hmm. you grew up in Japan and you came to the United States in your early 20s. So what did you know about Tokai, or Yokai rather, in Japan when you were there growing up? I feel like I never had a chance to learn like deeply about it. So I think, I mean, this is a really great opportunity for me to learn about yokai because I feel like not a lot of Japanese people even know about it. It's hmm. interesting. Okay. So you, you had to come here to learn about yokai, <laughs> <laughs> which is a Japanese folklore tradition. That's interesting. All right. Thank you. I think I I, I think people will realize after once they leave the country. I think people will see more about what is happening in Japan and what we have to improve, um, you know, Japanese culture. Well, well thank you, Megumi, uh, for organizing this really wonderful event and for to Matthew and Matt. Thank you. Thank your you. And your knowledge and experience and your artwork with us. So when are you two guys going to get together and like, you're the writer and you're the illustrator so yeah we're just so busy you know so yeah. much going on one of these days and the hard thing is that we we live so far away from each other you know matt's in tokyo and, and i'm all the way out in in the middle of the rural area so uh i don't get to go into the big city all that often I, i'm kind of in the mountains digging up yokai where they live yeah <laughs> well i'm looking forward to your first collaboration that's for sure Thank you. Um, so unfortunately, we have to wrap it up. Um, but I hope you learned a lot of things about yokai and also about Japanese culture today. Um, so this uh, rec event is recorded and we will send it to you um, soon, as soon as we can. So you will have a recording um, if you sign up for this event. I mean, I'm, I'm sure every, everyone who are here today already signed up for this event. So you will be able to receive the email and the recording from us. Um, before we wrap up the event, I'd like to announce some of our upcoming events. Um, I will share the screen. So next month, uh, we have an International Education Week um, from November 14th to 18th. Um, we are hosting Japanese calligraphy experience. Um, I mean, sorry, um, this is a part of our activity, but it is hosted by ISL Club. Um, we have Japanese calligraphy experience on November 14th. And we have a kimono makeup demo and a performance event by Nihon Bio dancer Hana Takehiro on November 15. And also, um, we have a Japanese dance performance by Hana Takehiro at Maribyrn University on November 17th. So you can see all the information on our website, also our Instagram. So please follow our Instagram, also subscribe our website. Um, thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. And um, don't forget to come back for our future event. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for Matthew and Matt for joining us and giving a presentation for us. Thanks. <laughs>